Dear colleagues, I want to welcome you all to today's interactive discussion, a security sector governance approach to the women, peace and security agenda, holding the security council, uh, sector to account on gender equality, taking place today, Tuesday, the 15th of June, 2021, and organized by the OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, and UN Women. This session is part of our joint collaboration to share and discuss the Gender and Security Toolkit. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be sent to all registrants as well as hosted on DCAF's website. Before we start, I wanna go over a few housekeeping issues. Interpretation is being provided for English, French, Russian, and Spanish. I take this opportunity to remind all panelists to speak slowly and clearly so that our interpreters can work effectively. During this session, all participants will be in listen only mode with microphones muted. Throughout the discussion, we will welcome questions coming in from the audience. If you would like to ask a question, please submit your question using the Q&A feature, and we will read as many of, as possible of your questions out loud to allow the panelists to respond. If you are interested in the response by a particular panelist, please indicate who you are directing your question to. At the end of today's webinar, we will share a link to a brief evaluation survey. This is a four minute survey and we encourage all of you to provide your honest feedback on today's session. Your feedback is valuable and helps us choose the topics and refine the format for the following webinars in this series. If you have any questions about this webinar, please feel free to send me a chat and I will do my best to respond to you as soon as possible. I want to quickly share a 10 second poll in just one second uh, to all of you. Uh, please respond with which language that you are listening in. So take just a moment to respond to the poll that I have up right now. I would now like to pass the floor over to Andrew Gardner, Deputy Head of the Human Rights Department at the OSCE ODIR with over 20 years of experience in human rights issues. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you, Natasha, for your kind introduction. Uh, on behalf of ODIR, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome all of you for joining us today in this conversation with a panel of distinguished experts from state institutions, civil society, and also international organizations. As Natasha mentioned, this webinar is one of a series grounded in the Gender and Security Toolkit, a set of resources jointly published by UN Women, OSC, ODEA, and DCAF in February of last year. The Gender and Security Toolkit offers guidance on how to promote gender equality within the security and justice sector and how those sectors can better contribute to gender equality within broader society. Today, we will discuss how promoting good governance within security sector institutions can help advance the women, peace and security agenda. We know that the implementation of the agenda is closely linked to transformative reforms in the security sector based on key principles of good governance to guide the provision, management and oversight of security. Good governance calls for addressing the needs of the entire population for, for accountability of duty bearers, that is states, towards the rights holders individuals and respect and protection of human rights of which gender equality is an integral part. It is in this framework based on equality applied to security that the women, peace and security agenda can be realized, i.e. through women's full and unhindered participation in security and peace efforts, access to justice and protection from discrimination and violence. I would now like to give the floor to Mr. Andre Mundar. He is Special Envoy for Women, Peace and Security for the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for some introductory remarks. Mr. Mundar, 
Since we are looking at the links between the security sector, governance, and the women, peace, and security agenda, we are particularly interested to hear how your personal past experience in the armed forces of Norway is informing your work on the women, peace, and security agenda. How do you plan to take it forward during the course of your mandate? Thank you. Mr. Andre Mundal, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, I am uh, very grateful to be here for this most important topic. And thank you very much to the organizers of this, uh, this event. And to your question, I think um, I have to say that first and foremost, my background has given me a clear understanding of the acute need to apply a gender perspective uh, throughout the security sector. Uh, I spent 12 years in the Norwegian army, uh, attending the officer candidate school, as well as the military academy. I worked several years in a, in a ranger battalion in the far north of Norway, and I was a platoon commander, uh, as well as spending a year with NATO uh, K4 in Kosovo. My last job in the armed forces was to train cadets at the Norwegian military academy to become officers in, in the army. So I've seen uh, sort of a great deal of the system from the inside. Looking back, I have to say that uh, I wish I knew more at the time. Uh, and I wish I could say that I was generally gender informed and knew what I needed to know in order to do a better job to address the needs and the strength of both uh, men and women. But uh, the blunt truth is that uh, I didn't. And the number of women was also so very limited, typically one to three in a hundred men, uh, same as among officers. So of course, their possibility to make the system gender responsive was also uh, fairly limited. I left the army in 2005, uh, five years after Security Council Resolution 3025. Uh, but uh, at that point, it still had not gotten close to the impact uh, as it has today. Now, I would say that theoretically, an organization full of only men could apply a gender perspective for both men and women throughout its organization and all its tasks. Theoretically, but I can also have lunch at the moon next week. Theoretically, uh, could it happen? Uh, yes, at least there is that theoretical chance. Uh, likely, absolutely not, not even close. And even if it did happen, it wouldn't really matter because such an organization would not meet the standards of accountability, participation, responsiveness, or effectiveness that the security sector should fulfill anyways. As we all know, the security sector are integral institutions to any state at the center of power in many ways. And thus gender balance in oversight institutions, its parts in leadership and ranks should be subject to the same logic of gender balance as any other institution. And as we all know, the easiest way to apply a gender perspective is to have both men and women present, particularly also where decisions are taken. So needless to say, the system that I was a part of and that we kept replicating, because that's often what you do, the decisions we took on a daily basis and the culture we built was obviously not very gender sensitive. And I can't even imagine how extremely tough it must have been for many of these women that had to endure the kind of world that we created, made for men, by men, and with little sense of a gender perspective. Particularly also because such a system would most likely only value certain traits, typically with a narrow form of manhood at the steering wheel, while other strengths that are critical to the need of our societies would not be found particularly valuable. Now, I am so very happy to say that uh, things have changed. Uh, if you take the Norwegian police, for example, in, in 2020, 35% of all Norwegian police in international operations and missions were women. And 
46% of all police in Norway are women, 24% in leading police positions, and 30, 37% in leading positions overall, meaning when you include the civilian part. And, and take a look at this. Today at the Norwegian Police Academy, 51.1% of all students are women. And 100% of all Norwegian police participating in international operations have attended courses and training in women, peace and security. In the Norwegian military, progress have also been made. Now 18.9% of all employees in the armed forces are women. And among conscripts, the percentage is 33%. I don't know if you are aware, but until 2015, only men were conscripts in Norway. But for the last six years, we have had conscriptions for, for uh, women as well. Uh, it does not mean that all available personnel at a certain age are conscript, but it means that the gender balance has improved a lot, with now 33% being uh, women. Uh, when I did the officer candidate school, uh, I remember particularly learning about improvise, adapt and overcome and how it was drilled into the deepest part of my being, that there are no obstacles, just get the job done. And this is sort of a, a brilliant thing about security institutions. And what always impressed me while I was in the army, the extreme level of effectiveness that can be applied when there is a task that really needs to be solved. This is one of the great advantages of security institutions. They are built and trained to solve missions with speed and accuracy. So with that in mind, it really shouldn't take decades for security institutions to vastly improve on implementing this agenda on women, peace and security. You just need political will and good security sector governance that can provide accountability meaning clear expectations for provision of security, independent authorities that oversee whether these expectations are met and impose sanctions if they are not, so that the security sector is held accountable for meeting the diverse needs of all parts of the population. And there is a role for all of us that we can play, meaning you and I. One thing that I would stress is the need to involve more men on this agenda, ironically, after what I've been talking about. And, and how do we do that? Well, there are many ways, but in general, I think it is important that we keep the door wide open and encourage those that we want to become engaged. I'll give you one example. I recently received a request from our NATO delegation about an event where they wanted someone to hold a presentation for NATO's political committee or Norwegian experiences with women in the armed forces. On such occasions, it is easy to use someone familiar, or I could do it myself. But I really want to use such opportunities to get some new voices out there, because I know it will encourage them as well. By going through the process, the preparations and the execution, and sometimes in strong systems and cultures, it's easier to get the message across when it comes from within. So we did some extra reaching out and managed to find a male army officer working in the Norwegian Special Operations Commando with keen interest on an operational level on how to include, on, on how including women increases their operational capacity. I know it's a little bit ironic that we need the involvement of men to enhance the involvement of women, and part of the problem is that the gender balance is way too skewed. But this is the women, peace and security agenda. It is an issue of peace and security for me, for you, for all of us and for our societies. So concluding, let's be open. Let's be creative and look for opportunities and new ways ahead. And in that, also finding new voices and advocates that can help us make progress. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Andre Mumbal. Uh, for firstly, for these very personal uh, reflections and uh, a very frank uh, evaluation of the 
certainly of the myriad of problems that existed in the past, but also um, some uh, commentary on how things have improved, which is, of course, always good to hear. Uh, thank you very much for those insightful remarks and also for your leadership in advancing the, the Women, Peace and Security agenda. It's now my privilege to introduce our speakers um, who are taking part in today's discussion. Firstly, Dr. Susan Atkins has over 10 years experience of oversight of security sector institutions, having set up and led bodies overseeing the police and the military in the UK. A lawyer and gender equality expert, she is a member of advisory boards at the Centre for Women, Peace and Security at the London School of Economics and at the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst. Dr. Katerina Levchenko is Government Commissioner for Gender Equality of Ukraine, Vice Chair of Gender Equality Commission of the Council of Europe, Doctor of Law and a Professor. As former, as former member of the Ukrainian Parliament from 2006 to 2007, Katerina was member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the OSCE and has more than 25 years of experience in protecting women's and human rights as an expert for various international organizations. She is the founder and the first president of the NGO La Strada Ukraine from 1997 to 2018. Carmen Rosa de Leon Escribano is a Guatemalan sociologist, executive director of the Institute of Education for Sustainable Development since 1996, and a consultant for national and international entities on social civil issues, gender, security sector, and justice reform, armed violence and development. She has participated in the Guatemala peace negotiations, as a delegate of the Civil Society Assembly, as a titular member of the Civil Society Security Advisory Council for the Presidency of the Republic since 2004. Agata Walchak is a governance and parliamentary strengthening expert at the United Nations Development Program in Bangkok. She manages a global initiative on the parliamentary dimension of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda that supports systematic partnerships between Parliament and civil society in six countries. Jamila Karapova is the head of the Ensam Diamond, a women's non-governmental organization based in Osh, Kyrgyzstan, since 2003. During the 2010 inter-ethnic conflict in the south of Kyrgyzstan, she was actively involved in the process of settlement and resolution. She is a member of the Public Council under the Ministry of Emergency Situations and as part of the Coordination Council for Social Protection of the Population and Children's Rights under the Government of the Kyrgyz Republic. I want to say thank you to each and every one of our distinguished speakers for being here today at this important event. Let's now go into the topics for today's webinar. 20 years after the adoption of Resolution 1325, progress in integrating the principles of good governments and global peace and security efforts remains slow. The security sector institutions rarely held accountable when failing to protect or meet the needs of all individuals, with women sidelined or, une or unevenly represented in security sector institutions, including in policymaking and an overall failure to link human rights protection and gender equality to peace and security. In this regard, oversight bodies such as national parliaments or national human rights institutions are key to advance good governments, but despite legal frameworks in place, they are yet to be recognized as an integral part of the implementation of the goals of the agenda. So in order to get us started, I would like to invite Dr. Susan Atkins to take to the floor and to draw from her personal experiences as an onwards person. 
Susan. Do oversight and particularly ombuds institutions have an important role in holding the security sector accountable on gender equality and on implementing the WPS? What are the key challenges they face? Susan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew. Could I just say, uh, my camera has been turned off. If you could turn my camera on, please. Uh, I can't turn it on, it says the host has turned me off. I don't know if that's possible. Uh, I'll start anyway. The short answer to your question is yes. And what I'd like to do is explain why I think it's important and how the importance of oversight is linked to those challenges. First, the security of a country and of its people is essential to the enjoyment of human rights. And history shows that inequality anywhere is a threat to security everywhere. And the current pandemic has just shown how globally we're all linked. So the issue of security in one part of the world is an issue of security in our part of the world. And it's important for security forces to reflect the people it serves, not just domestically, but for those global purposes and global security as well. And women are underrepresented across society and do not have equal access to justice, economic or personal security. So there's no human security without the active and full participation of women. Now, why does oversight matter to that? The first challenge I think is the culture and ethos of the armed forces. Mr. Mundell talked about operational effectiveness and having worked with our armed forces for now over 10 years, I started as the military ombudsman in 2007. I admire the operational effectiveness and operational independence, but it can get in the way. So there's a culture of ministers, governments, senior military setting the policy, the aim, the strategic intent, and leaving the military personnel to deliver. That means that they're very jealous of operational independence and do not want any oversight body to interfere. There's a culture and ethos of hard security. Human security is growing in importance, but it's still seen as an add-on. There's a culture and ethos of looking after your own people. At its best, it's the admirable servant leader. At its worst, it becomes a culture of defensiveness and protection, misplaced loyalty. What happens in this platoon stays in this platoon. And if women raise issues and complaints about how they've been treated by their peers, then they're seen as the outsider and the enemy. There's a culture of macho masculinity, it's changing, but there's a failure I have found to recognize just how male focused the perspective of most military personnel is. There's not full understanding of what accountability and transparency means. So when I was uh, the service complaints ombudsman, the service complaints commissioner, the forerunner of the military ombudsman we have today in the UK, I would try and persuade senior leaders to be open with the people who made a complaint, but they thought that would be a challenge to their authority, that they would not be able to command effectively if they had to explain themselves. There's a lack of awareness between military effectiveness and military culture. So the women, peace and security agenda is seen as totally separate from how the military treats its own men and women. The UK's National Action Plan, which was reported annually to Parliament and the last report was December 2020, 2020 is admirable in what it says the UK is doing. 
but there's no mention of actually women's representation in the military. It talks about the increase in women in, uh, in peacekeeping roles, which has gone up to 9%, which is good. But there's no recognition that actually the involvement of women, which has stayed at around 11%, uh, is actually having an impact on operational effectiveness. And that means that women, peace and security agenda is seen as an issue for other countries, not our country with the exception here of uh, Northern Ireland, where, as you all know, we did have an uh, issue of civil and political unrest for many, many, many years. And the final challenge is that there is a constant churn of personnel. As Service Complaints Commissioner, I had to meet people every two years as they changed roles. And you had to start again with very many people to try and explain what you were doing was important, why it mattered, and what I expected of them. So oversight, whether it's parliamentary oversight or ombudsman oversight, is really important to challenge, to publicly hold the military to account, but also to educate. And that education role is very important. But there are challenges. There are challenges involved with oversight bodies themselves. And I'll very briefly conclude by telling, talking about these. The first is the remit of the oversight body. A parliamentary committee or national human rights institution may have a wider remit than a military ombudsman. But of course, that means that they may find it difficult to focus on the military on women, peace and security particularly. And when I was involved in the International Conference of Ombudsmen for Armed Forces, we found that those who, who were national human rights institutions got fewer complaints from military than those who are specialist ombudsmen. It depends whether your ombudsman has own motion powers or simply reactive to complaints. Can they only take complaints from military personnel or can they con take complaints from citizens or indeed from those citizens of states in which their, their military forces are involved? Can they take complaints by their own military personnel against the actions and behaviors of other states' military personnel? These are all issues to do with remit. There are issues to do with accountability. Who appoints the ombudsman? Who pays for the ombudsman? To whom do they have to report? Is it to report to government or to parliament? And Canada in particular, in relation to sexual uh, harassment, sexual violence, has had huge issues in the last few years in relation to that and to control of the ombudsman and the limits of the Ombudsman to deal effectively with complaints against the most senior leaders. There are issues of prioritization. In 2014, I was involved in the UK's first international conference on women, peace and security, which was a huge step forward. But I wasn't able to follow it up because I was prioritizing on getting my recommendations for widening the powers of the Complaints Commissioner to an Ombudsman through Parliament, which would have happened in 2015. And then finally, there's the challenge of churn within the Ombuds institutions themselves. I was uh, there for over seven years, my predecessor for five, and we just got a new Ombudsman. So these are all the challenges, and I'm happy to talk later about what might be done to overcome them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan, for that very detailed and, and thorough analysis. Um, I'd like to go now uh, to get the perspective of a government official. So I'm going to turn to Dr. Katerina Levchenko to get her insights. Um, and incidentally, uh, whilst I'm asking a round of questions, please do um, 
everyone here participating today, put your own questions in the, the Q&A section. Um, and please do indicate who the question is directed at if there is a specific speaker you'd like to answer the question, uh, because we'll have plenty of time to uh, take all of your questions uh, later as well. Uh, but first, Katerina, uh, Ukraine embarks in the reform of its security sector while addressing a conflict within its borders and while implementing the first 1325 National Action Plan. What were the challenges in pursuing this good government's agenda from a women peace and security perspective? <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for your questions. And uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to participate at such uh, an interesting event, which touches upon extremely important issues of ensuring gender equality in security and defense uh, sector governance. Why important and tough question? Because we firmly believe that uh, equal rights and opportunities for women and men in all spheres of life, including security and defense sector, is prerequisite for the success of the European and Euro-Atlantic integration of Ukraine. And this conviction is uh, embodied in specific action. So, in 2016, uh, during, uh, uh, as you mentioned, the hot phase of ongoing aggression of uh, Russian Federation against Ukraine and occupation by uh, Russian Federation of the territory of Crimea and parts of Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast, Ukraine adopted the first national action plan on implementation UN Security Council Resolution 1325. And since then has taken action to improve women's participation in peace processes, security and defense sector, and protecting women's rights related to the conflict and post-conflict context. And this was the reason why since 2017, the deputy prime minister on European and Euro-Atlantic integration has been coordinating the national gender equality um, machinery in Ukraine. And as a result of the implementation of the first national action plan, equal opportunities are provided for women to serve in the armed forces of Ukraine, which is of major importance during uh, ongoing occupation of the Crimea and some uh, territories of east of Ukraine. And we really observe the increase in uh, amount and uh, role of women in armed forces and uh, security and defense sector in whole, which is a very positive tendency. And let me present some figures. More than 57,000 women serve in Ukrainian army. Uh, more than 24,000 in the national police. And we can compare with figures from 2015, it was around 80,000 of women, 25% less than now. More than 11,000 in the state border police and over 5,000 in the National Guard. Figures are not bad, uh, but even positive developments create new challenges or discover old problems. Uh, among them are gender stereotypes in society and security and defense sector particularly. Lack of understanding of importance of ensuring gender equality as strategic direction of developing and reforming security and defense sector and effective tools for its implementation. Uh, we also see problem uh, in institutions and structures, lack of gender competence and lack of infrastructure for women, like for example, uniform. October 2020, Ukrainian government adopted the second national action plan on 1325 until 2025. And it, as for me, it is a sign 
of the strong political will to promote for the women peace and security agenda. And we look at this plan as a framework that allows integrating gender equality principle into different programs and actions, both at national and local level. Plan reflects, reflects all above mentioned problems and challenges. Challenges. It contains, um, it contains uh, 43 tasks and the different institutions of security and defense sectors are responsible for implementing of 23 from them, which must give more opportunities for women and gender equality in security and defense sector. Among planned actions are Strengthen and legal support of gender policy in the security and defense sector. Uh, for example, uh, developing an internal instruction on combating gender-based violence, uh, including domestic violence and sexual harassment. Developing and strengthening the, the institutional mechanism, in particular, the introduction of position of gender advisors to the commanders. By the way, tomorrow we will um, start the training cycle for gender advisors, both civilian and from security and defense sectors developed in con and conducted by uh, OCE, ODIM, in cooperation with apparatus of government commissioner on gender equality policy. And uh, uh, it's very important uh, step uh, in uh, increasing and strengthening uh, institutional mechanism. Formation of gender competences of staff, ensuring the inclusion of gender approaches in the training process. Using guidelines on integrating gender approaches in the training specialist for the security and defense sectors of Ukraine. Uh, these guidelines prepared by big group of uh, authors with the technical support of UN women uh, and financial support of Sweden government. And what I would like to mention that authors widely used uh, with references, uh, the um, materials uh, prepared by OC, DCAF and ODIV. And it's, for me, it's a very good example how we can use uh, uh, materials uh, developed by international organizations at national level using so-called tailor-made approach. And uh, one more um, task related to providing continuous monitoring and evaluation of the process. So, as for me, uh, Ukraine does not put gender equality agenda out of the focus, and it's very important for um, continue our uh, course uh, uh, on European and Euro-Atlantic integration. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katrina, for that very detailed and in insightful uh, perspective. Um, certainly, Ukraine's example is, uh, is a critical and in, indeed uh, an inspira inspiration uh, to all of us uh, for the very fact that you embarked on security sector reform in, in such a time of crisis. Um, undoubtedly, many, many lessons for, for, for others in different parts of the world as well. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to turn now to Agata. Um, on your area of expertise in particular. Uh, pursuing effective democratic civilian control over the security sector also calls for a more active role of national parliaments. How can parliaments be agents of change in the promotion of the women, peace and security agenda? Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so let me place my response in the context of the security sector oversight uh, specifically. Um, a sector that doesn't easily lend itself to oversight uh, because there is a national tendency and sometimes a, legitim a legitimate need for, for its actors to operate in secrecy and within their own silos. But this 
does not take away the need for accountability and for transparency over things like the spending of significant public resources, uh, but also issues of political influence, respect for human rights and civil liberties, and looking through the lens of women, peace and security over whether the sector responds to and meets the specific security needs of all people, regardless of sexual orientation or, or gender identity. What that women, peace and security lens also helps us to see, and that's what Andre helpfully uh, pointed out earlier, is that this form of accountability becomes problematic when a traditionally male dominated sector accounts to an equally male dominated and gender insensitive institution or, or a mechanism. Conversely, when, when that oversight is made inclusive and when it reflects 50% of the population in both its structure and in considering its security needs, it can be very powerful means of uh, achieving good security oversight on the one hand, and uh, the realization of, of the women, peace and security agenda on the other. Now, this is something that we try to demonstrate over the last uh, three years through our work with parliaments um, in, in this area with the support of the government of Norway, Andre and, and his predecessor. Uh, and it's exactly what we looked at, the accountability and inclusion gains that can be made when an informed and well-capacitated parliament um, joins hands with independent oversight bodies like the Ombudsman Institution and civil society. And so I would like to share three lessons uh, from, from this work uh, that I think answer your question uh, quite well. And the first lesson is that parliament-led accountability can be very effective in dealing with risk and crisis on an inclusive and holistic basis. So today's risks, tend to be systemic and so they require equally systemic uh, solutions. Uh, the, the COVID crisis is a, is a major example of this. Um, what we learned from the pandemic is that the most effective and gender sensitive crisis responses and later on preparedness strategies are those that factor in healthcare, social and economic security, education or, or justice sector to name some as well as uh, responding to the legitimate, traditionally defined security needs. Um, parliaments that have a strong and multi-party committee system that works systematically with civil society and oversight bodies are the only oversight mechanism that's equipped and that's mandated to look holistically at multiple um, sectoral responses at a time to ensure that funds are properly expended, that powers are used responsibly, and also that transparency and accountability and, and national ownership are derived over time. The second lesson I wanted to share is that um, parliamentary-led partnerships are important drivers of gender equality across the board. Uh, gender equality doesn't just happen. It's about changing the culture through political action and through societal support. So in other words, a change in, in hearts and minds. And it would be realistic to expect one of the most male dominated sectors in which we often see so-called militarized masculinities play out. It, it would be unreal, unrealistic to have equal representation of women or, or to be particularly responsive to the needs of, um, of, 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 of women where inequality persists in key governance institutions and in the dynamics of social power more generally. Now, parliaments are where a legitimate change in cultural norms and attitudes happens uh, and, and manifests through the participation of women as parliamentarians, through laws and budgets that are sensitive to these gendered power relations in society, and also through um, a dialogue and partnerships between critical actors, institutional partners, a political leadership, and the broad civic coalition that charts pathways for gender equality and, and women's participation. And now the third and final lesson I wanted to share is that effective parliamentary oversight requires mutual buy-in. So for the security sector oversight to be truly effective, you need the social contract that is um, a framework for understanding the relations between citizens uh, and state institutions. You need that to operate between actors involved there as well. And this means that the sector needs to be trusting enough to be open and that the politicians who oversee it 
need to agree not to play tactical politics uh, with the sensitive information that's entrusted to them. And evidence shows that this skill is generally associated with women-led processes that are less partisan, that tend to be less confrontational and uh, more collaborative. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Agata, for your insights. Uh, we, we're running slightly behind time, so I want to, to go straight now to, to Carmen Rosa. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to share your insights drawing from the Guatemalan context. According to your experience, what are the main challenges for the implementation of the women's peace, security, peace and security agenda in the context of the RSS? Gracias y buenos días desde acá a todos. Creo que hay diferentes horarios acá en esta en esta reunión. Eh, hay que tomar en cuenta y después de haber escuchado a los otros colegas que la situación en Guatemala como país post conflicto tenemos hay dos elementos a tomar en cuenta. El primero es que eh, de por sí históricamente es un país que tiene altos niveles de violencia contra la mujer. Eh, la violencia contra la mujer y la violencia intrafamiliar es el delito más denunciado incluso a día de hoy. Eh, altos niveles de impunidad en cuanto a la solución de casos que implican violencia contra la mujer Eh, nosotros hemos medido que hay alrededor de, tardan alrededor de 957 días el poder tener una sentencia firme en cuanto a casos de violencia contra la mujer y los casos que llegan son muy pocos. Este es un elemento. El otro es que viniendo de, una, de, de un conflicto cuando, cuando se firmaron los acuerdos de paz y se elaboró la, la agenda de la reforma al sector seguridad, el uso de la fuerza, la lógica de la sociedad es, es que seguridad es equivalente al uso de la fuerza y al uso de la violencia. Estos dos elementos pues complican la participación de la mujer en procesos, eh, sobre todo en las, en las Fuerzas Armadas y en la Policía, en la policía Nacional Civil. Eh, ¿Qué cambios encontramos nosotros? ¿Cuáles fueron los desafíos que encontramos para implementar una agenda de paz, eh, de mujer, paz y seguridad adentro, por ejemplo, de las fuerzas policiales? Lo primero es eh, uno de los elementos que se enfrentan es la transformación física de las mismas eh, instalaciones eh, de policía y las instalaciones militares, porque eh, si deben acoger más mujeres deben tener también la separación eh, de, las, de, de los alojamientos. Aquí en, en, en Guatemala es una policía que está en cuarteles, es decir, entonces implica que eh, esto debe duplicarse para poder acoger a mujeres y hombres. Y esto dificultó en un principio la absorción de más mujeres dentro de la policía eh, civil. Luego eh, también el, el implica que, o sea, para la sociedad esperaba con los acuerdos de paz que fueran tratados los problemas de la sociedad y, y si los problemas son la violencia contra la mujer, la lógica debería ser que hubiera más mujeres dentro de las fuerzas policiales. Sin embargo, eh, si bien empezamos con un 9% de participación de las mujeres en la policía, hoy día, 20 años después, solo hemos llegado a un 15% de la fuerza y la mayor parte de ella no en el mando, sino en, en, como agentes de diferentes eh, servicios, incluso en la misma administración eh, de la policía. Y esto es porque no se dan las condiciones necesarias para que haya una participación plena de la mujer dentro de las fuerzas policiales. Es decir, eh, cuando se habla de una transformación debemos enfrentar Eh, la situación en que las políticas institucionales deben modificarse para garantizar esa igualdad y, y, y de acceso a la carrera, a los ascensos, 
a las promociones, a la profesionalización. Encontramos que muchos de los reglamentos, eh, si bien se habla de la, del incremento de mujeres dentro de las fuerzas policiales, muchos de los reglamentos todavía están orientados a favorecer, digamos, una visión en la cual son los hombres los que tienen la movilidad y los que logran las becas, los que logran los ascensos en una forma más rápida. También entendemos que eh, las mujeres tienen necesidades diversas y esto para poder promover la participación de las mujeres dentro de las instituciones es necesario también el poder dotarlas de las capacidades para poder ejercer, por ejemplo, puestos de mando. Eh, una policía como la nuestra, por ejemplo, el, los ascensos o las de, las, los destinos que se dan como ascenso para otros lugares eh, dentro del mismo país, no van acompañados de un traslado de la familia. Y normalmente la mujer es la que está siempre a cargo de la familia independientemente de la actividad que realiza. Esto hace que muchas mujeres no quieran eh, o no puedan eh, obtener esos puestos de mando porque se ven obligadas a quedarse con la familia en el lugar de residencia y se les imposibilita movilizarse eh, para poder ascender a puestos. Entonces hay una contradicción siempre se, se, cuando se plantea este tema Casi siempre dentro de las fuerzas lo que contestan es, ah, bueno, las mujeres no quieren participar, las mujeres son las que escogen no participar, si bien tienen la posibilidad de hacerlo, pero no hay condiciones dentro de la misma estructura policial y dentro de las mismas políticas que favorezcan esa participación de la mujer en lugares, eh, en lugares de más toma de decisiones. Eh, otro, otro tema que aquí se ha hablado también y es muy importante es el tratamiento de los códigos disciplinarios hacia el acoso sexual y la violencia contra la mujer. Siempre en las entidades jerárquicas es complicado la denuncia de las mujeres hacia, hacia, hacia su jefe. Y por, por una parte, por otra parte, esa, ese espíritu de cuerpo que se habló que hace que una mujer denuncie, pero sin embargo automáticamente es estigmatizada dentro del mismo servicio eh, por haber denunciado al hombre o se dice que es una forma de manipulación por parte de las mujeres. Este es un tema que creo que, que es necesario tratar eh, con más desde la perspectiva institucional de mejorar las condiciones y las relaciones de trabajo, pero también de asumir una conciencia por parte de los hombres dentro de la institución de, eh, de la existencia eh, de estos abusos eh, en cuanto a violencia contra la mujer y el acoso. Sobre todo el acoso es uno de los problemas eh, más importantes que encontramos dentro de estas relaciones institucionales. Eh, vemos que cuando se enfoca una reforma al sector seguridad es no solo la situación de la mujer dentro de las fuerzas policiales o de, los, o, o de las fuerzas eh, militares, sino también cómo esa institución debe cambiar su lógica hacia lo externo y la, el tratamiento de la sociedad. Esto pensando lo que eh, cuando, eh, cuando nosotros eh, pasamos de un paradigma eh, de una seguridad centrada en la violencia y en el uso de la violencia y en la persecución, pasamos de a un paradigma de una seguridad humana. Y esto implica también entonces la transformación de la institución no solo hacia adentro para mejorar las, capa las capacidades y mejorar las posibilidades de las mujeres para entrar, sino también cómo esta institución se refleja hacia el exterior. En ese sentido, eh, volvemos otra vez al, al, al tema, si la violencia intrafamiliar y la violencia contra la mujer es el del delito más denunciado, sin embargo, las fuerzas eh, policiales no están y ni siquiera la, el sistema de justicia está tratando en la misma medida esa demanda. Es decir, eh, se especializa en otros casos, en otros temas y por lo tanto siempre hay un déficit en cuanto a mejorar las condiciones de las mujeres o de las víctimas para poder denunciar. Encontramos si hay un 15% de fuerzas de mujeres dentro de la policía, el poder atender un delito eh, con tanta, eh, tan amplio en el país, pues hace que eh, siga habiendo eh, muchas mujeres que son violentadas y que deben dar su primer testimonio a un policía hombre dentro de las comisarías. Esto eh, implica entonces también una transformación incluso física de los espacios de las comisarías 
para poder escuchar eh, a, a mujeres o a niños que han sido violentados y vemos que, ese, eh, que recurrentemente esto no se contempla como una política integral de atención a la sociedad. Eh, también es necesario atender esa violencia de género en, en una forma especializada por el mismo sistema de justicia. Eh, un, de, un, da, un detalle tan simple como que eh, normalmente las órdenes de, de captura por violencia intrafamiliar o por no querer pagar el sustento eh, hacia el hogar eh, siempre están a la cola de las, de las, eh, de las pilas de, 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 de la policía, es decir, es el delito que más, que más existe, pero el que menos se persigue y el que menos se activa por parte de los cuerpos policiales. Hay que haber una, tiene que haber una doble insistencia para que realicen eh, estas, eh, este tipo de capturas. Por ejemplo, hablando con la fiscalía, dicen nosotros hay muchas investigaciones que no podemos seguir porque simplemente la policía no abona en la investigación o no le da la importancia necesaria para seguir las investigaciones en materia de violencia de género. Finalmente, decir que consideramos también muy importante la participación de las mujeres en las operaciones de paz y que vemos como un mecanismo también de externalización de las posibilidades y de internalización de esas nuevas perspectivas de género y de tratamiento de las mujeres dentro de las instituciones en el ámbito de Mujer, Paz y Seguridad. Gracias. Thank you very much indeed, Carmen Rosa, for those very important um, insights that you've shared with us. Uh, now I want to um, go to the perspective of another civil society organization, uh, far away from Guatemala, but pos possibly with um, some similar and possibly different challenges uh, that have been faced. So I want to um, go to um, Jamila. Um, following the inter-ethnic violence in 2010 in Kyrgyzstan, your organization worked closely with the security sector institutions such as the police and the military to advance the women, peace and security agenda. What were the challenges and where do you see progress since then? Спасибо за вопрос. Добрый день, уважаемые участники вебинара. Большое спасибо за возможность участия. И я представляю, как сказал господин Андре, Небольшая страна в Центральной Азии, Кыргызстан. Население чуть больше 6,5 человек. И, к сожалению, наша страна последние 15 лет подвергается периодическим политическим кризисам, один из которых в 2010 году привел к межэтническому конфликту в моем городе на юге Кыргызстана. И именно этот десятый год этот конфликт послужил как бы стартом для начала обсуждения повестки «Женщина. Мир. Безопасность» среди гражданского общества и среди государственных структур. Я хочу сказать, что до этого, где-то в 2008 году, при поддержке ЮНИФЭМ, это бывший ООН «Женщины», мы участвовали в региональных конференциях по вопросу «Женщины. Мир. Безопасность» по резолюции 1325. И я хочу отметить, что участники из Кыргызстана, государственные деятели, неправительственные секты, мы не, не хорошо понимали ту повестку. У нас нет конфликтов, у нас нет войн, нету в принципе, благополучная страна была, и поэтому эту резолюцию мы не сразу поняли, когда коллеги, партнеры, подруги с Таджикистана, с Кавказа очень бурно обсуждали эту повестку. Участники с Казахстана, с Кыргызстана мы как-то не очень понимали. Но кровавые события 2010 года, как я сказала, послужили отправной точкой. И В 2012 году республикой был принят первый национальный план по 1325. Сейчас республика находится 
на, в стадии утверждения четвертого плана. И наша организация «Энсан Диамор», мы принимали активное участие в имплементации, в локализации этих мероприятий наших всех национальных планов. У нас такой был небольшой, как бы, постоянная приверженность работы с силовым блоком. Это, во-первых, Министерство внутренних дел, это полит... милиция. Это один год мы работали с вооруженными силами, это Министерство обороны. В один год мы даже, даже достучались до Национального комитета государственной безопасности. Это очень редко бывает, но два года мы с ними тоже сотрудничали по имплементации повестки «Женщина. Мир. Безопасность» в работу данных учреждений. За эти годы провели в начале, в те годы, в 12-14 годы, в 16 годы, мы, основная цель была повышение потенциала, повышение их чувствительности к повестке «Женщина. Мир. Безопасность». Сейчас, послед... за эти годы, мы объездили почти все области страны, встречались с... и проводили образовательные мероприятия и с низшим составом, и с руководящим составом этих силовых структур. Какие были, на ваш вопрос, какие были проблемы? Проблемы, какие ответили ранее стоящие наши эксперты, во-первых, это нечувствительность мужчин, нечувствительность силового блока. Как сказал в начале господин Андрей Мундал, сектор безопасности создан для осуществления власти и контроля. То есть мир, как он сказал, мир, созданный мужчинами для мужчин. И поэтому работать с представителями правоохранительных органов – это очень трудно из-за их нечувствительности к данной теме. Вторая проблема была такая, как текучесть кадров. То есть обучаешь, встречаешься, они вроде в теме. Через год приезжаешь, уже другие люди, уже другой руководитель. То есть текучесть кадров и ротация кадров. Третья большая проблема – это загруженность. Загруженность силового блока своей основной. Если участковый милиционер, он занимается общественной безопасностью. Если, например, уголовный розыск, они занимаются раскрытием тяжелых преступлений. То есть загруженность большая. И основная проблема, так как мы живем в традиционном мусульманском обществе, основная проблема – это стереотипы. Это приверженность наших мужчин вот таким традиционным взглядом, приверженность религиозным взглядом, которые не всегда поддерживают и понимают повестку прав женщин. Ну, да, проблема еще та, та, как представленность женщин. Вот я послушала, Андрей Мундал сказал, что около 36% в Норвегии сотрудниц женщин, из них 20% на руководящих постах. Госпожа Екатерина Левченко тоже сказала, что 7 тысяч вооруженных силах, 24 тысячи женщин в полиции. В Кыргызстане официально мы нашли статистику, 13% служащих в милиции – это женщины. Это совершенно мало, и женщины не находятся на уровнях принятия решений, они находятся на обслуживающих должностях. То есть проблема в непредставленности женщин в силовом структуре. И в конце я хочу сказать про прогресс. Все-таки, да, проблем много, но мы движемся. И когда встречаешься с этими сотрудниками через год, через два, люди понимают, люди приветствуют эту повестку. Особенно в свете последних 2-3 месяца назад случился у нас приграничный конфликт с Таджикистаном. И буквально недавно мы были в тех областях, знают про резолюцию 1325, и милиционеры, и военные, и местные жители. То есть за вот эти годы осведомленность 
поддержка этой повестки мы встречаем повсюду. И еще прогресс такой, что наряду с обучением, наряду с повышением потенциала, также мы предлагаем и внедрение этих программ в учебные планы учебных заведений для силового блока. Как я говорила, в, СН, в ГКНБ, в Национальной безопасности, в Академии внутренних дел, в нашем областном учебном заведении для милиционеров были предложены нами и утверждены учебные программы по правам человека, и там есть несколько часов, посвященных гендерному равенству, а также повестки женщин в мир безопасности. Спасибо большое. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Jamelia. Um, and that concludes our, our first round of questions for the speakers. Um, I, I want to move straight into the, the next round of questions because we're we're slightly behind time um but also i i, I wanted to just remind everyone that um everyone participating here today that whatever questions you have for the um, speakers please put them in the um the q a and and i'll be able to get to them and, and direct them to the the speaker uh, that you indicate uh, you want to answer your question. Uh, we have questions already, but there's still plenty of time to, to write your questions there. Please do so. Now, we're going to go into another round of, of, of questions. If I could just ask all of our um, distinguished speakers today, if you could be as um, concise and as, as brief as possible, because we're running over time. Um, and going into the first question, which I want to, to pose to, to Katerina, um, staying on the same topic of, of, of civil society organizations, drawing from your own personal experience, how has your work uh, with women's rights civil society organization informed your current work as you lead Ukraine's policy work on gender issues? Uh, thank you, Andrew, for your question. And really, I can continue Jamila's uh, presentation speaking about role of non-governmental organizations. And my short answer is my personal experience as women rights defenders and activists plays a really crucial role in my current work. Uh, my experience, uh, if speak about my experience, since um, 1997 till 2018, I have been working as a chair of Ukrainian non-governmental organization La Strada, which is a member of well-known international La Strada network. On the other hand, cooperation with civil society organizations is an important task for government commissioner for gender equality policy, according to the regulation on government commissioner adopted uh, four years ago by cabinet of ministers of Ukraine. Um, given my previous, uh, given uh, my answer on your previous question, I mentioned that we firmly believe that gender equality uh, in all spheres of life, including security and defense sector, is an important prerequisite for the success of European and Euro-Atlantic integration of Ukraine. And now I can reformulate that sentence and. Uh, uh, I formulate uh, it uh, next uh, like way. I firmly believe that strategic cooperation with the civil society organizations is a prerequisite for the success of formation and implementation of gender equality policy and achievement uh, equal rights and opportunities for men and women. And this conviction is embodied in a specific actions. Uh, the first, creating the platform for regulation communication uh, among uh, me as a government commissioner with civil society 
uh, organizations, first of all, uh, women's NGOs and uh, feministic organizations. Uh, the name of such platform, Equal Rights and Equal Opportunities. It's a virtual platform and it gives us opportunity to share information, to share expertise, to inform, to share news and uh, about different events or about trainings or, or other activities. Second, making the process of developing strategic documents on gender equality inclusive and open for uh, civil society organizations. For me, it's very important tool how we can cooperate with uh, civil society organizations. And I can give you some examples. As I mentioned before, last year, Ukraine adopted the second national action plan on 1325. It happened uh, in October 2020. Before adopting this uh, plan, uh, we uh, developed the draft of the document in cooperation with civil society organizations, international organizations, and uh, um, international organizations. We conducted eight planning sessions uh, on uh, developing this um, national action plan. And according to the data of uh, Ukrainian Women Fund, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, leading uh, uh, women NGO, more than 80, 80 women rights uh, organizations were being participating in the process. Uh, I consider it's really a big success uh, for inclusion women organizations and activists, both from national and uh, uh, local level in the process of developing national policy. As a result, we look at this plan as the second generation plan, result oriented, measurable and inclusive. And uh, among organizations which uh, took part in the creation of the document, I can uh, name uh, La Strada, uh, Ukrainian Women Veterans Movement, National Council uh, of Women of Ukraine, Ukrainian Women Fund, and uh, other, other organizations. As government, we use this, the same approach in the process of developing uh, other documents, for example, the plan on implementing um, communication strategy on gender equality. This communication strategy was adopted by cabinet of ministers and it's necessary to develop the adopted plan, uh, adopt plan on its uh, implementation. And uh, um, this uh, plan, uh, uh, draft of plan, uh, plan at the moment, contains the separate chapters on breaking gender stereotypes, which is big challenges for us in promoting gender equality in security and defense sectors. And special chapter on promoting women plus and security agenda in whole. And this year we began uh, the process of developing a new national like, strategic document uh, that will ensure effective integration of gender aspects into all spheres of governance. We call this document National Strategy for Gender Equality. And one more time, we created a working group um, from representatives of government, international civil society organizations, representatives of local authorities, um, amalgamated territorial communities uh, to prepare a draft of this document. And for me, uh, it is like an um, example of implementation of uh, like international commitments of Ukraine on uh, women rights and gender equality and uh, ensuring cooperation with civil society organizations. Of course, we, uh, uh, together with the non-governmental organization, organize and conduct a lot of trainings and training course for, for different groups of specialists, including uh, representatives of security and defense sector. Uh, we also uh, conduct common research and uh, make common publications. 
And among uh, such researches, I'd like to mention only one on anti-gender movement in Ukraine, anti-gender groups in Ukraine. Such research last year was conducted in collaboration with Ukrainian uh, Women Fund, La Strada, and Association of Women in Media. Katerina, I'm sorry to interrupt. Could I ask you to conclude because we're running very short of time? Yeah, and, and just to conclude that it was very important for us to advocate ratification of Istanbul Convention which is the target for anti-gender manipulation. And at the end, the good news from Ukraine. Uh, last week, members of Ukrainian parliament uh, from different parliamentary parties uh, created and registered a new uh, parliamentary caucus for ratification Istanbul Convention, which for us is a really strong step for implementing and uh, this document at national level. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Katrina. Um, without further ado, I want to go straight to, to Carmen and also to the example of Guatemala again. Um, and now again, from your own personal efforts to strengthen the oversight of uh, private security companies, how has this work helped the implementation of the peace process and of the women, peace and security agenda in Guatemala? Sí, gracias. Bueno, sabemos que la incorporación del enfoque de género a los procesos de a los procesos de reforma al sector seguridad en gran medida están condicionados por el avance de políticas públicas en la materia. Eh, en la medida en que se puedan avanzar en políticas sectoriales eh, para orientar y mejorar la participación de la mujer en todos los ámbitos, en esa misma medida existirán también condiciones para adoptar el plan de acción, ¿verdad? Y, la, el, el, y las, el, lo que se deriva de los planes de mujer, paz y seguridad. Sin embargo, pues en el, si, si veíamos que en el sector seguridad era complicada la participación de las mujeres, pues en el, en el de las empresas privadas de seguridad, que siendo un servicio, como su nombre indica, privado, es todavía más complicada la participación de las mujeres. Sin embargo, eh, sorry, se han hecho esfuerzos, es decir, en el caso de la seguridad privada, eh, representa el 2% de la fuerza de toda la seguridad privada de acuerdo a las investigaciones que hemos realizado. Sin embargo, hemos encontrado una vía importante para poder hacer esa auditoría Carmen, y para I'm poder sorry, hacer esa implementación de, de, de enfoque de género dentro de la seguridad privada, que es sobre todo trabajar con los usuarios de la seguridad privada. De hecho, hemos visto que a través de los usuarios, hacer conciencia con los usuarios de los servicios de seguridad privada permite el poder mejorar o el poder en la, eh, demandar unos servicios Carmen, mejores Carmen, y más garantizados me? por parte de, los, de las empresas de seguridad privada. Hay que entender también que la lógica de, de que la seguridad I, se asocia al uso de violencia y al uso de armas también lleva Spanish, a que en los ámbitos de la course? seguridad privada el uso de la fuerza se asocia a los hombres eh, en general también. ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, a veces lo que es importante y que, y que creo que es en todos los aspectos, pero sobre todo en el ámbito de la seguridad privada, es la ausencia de visibilización eh, de las mujeres eh, eh, por parte de... O sea, Carmen, la visibilización I'm very sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to stop because we can't have Esto haría, translation. Sorry. Carmen, I think... We had some technical problems with the interpretation. I don't know if our interpreters can hear us, but um, we... She, Carmen, you're speaking in the Spanish channel. You need to come out of the Spanish channel. No, I am, I, okay. I am, I, I, I was in the English channel. Okay. Okay. Now it's okay. Ahora me entienden? Ahora me escuchan? Interpreters, is that better? Colleagues, is that better? Interpreter, Carmen, can you can you say a few words, please? Yes, sí, me pueden escuchar. Colleagues, is that, shall we continue? 
I believe that may. I'm, I'm sorry, Let, let's, I'm very sorry, Carmen, because of these technical problems, but I think the best thing now is if, if we go to Agata and, uh, and we try and come back to you once we, we solve the problem, uh, the technical problems, which allow us to do the, the translation. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna, I apologies to that. Uh, apologies for that. I, I'm very sorry. Hopefully we'll be able to come back to you in a few minutes. So I'm going to go straight to um, Agata now. And if you could tell us, based on your work with parliaments on the advancement of the Women, Peace and Security agenda, what are some successful examples of partnerships between parliaments, civil society organisations and or security sector actors for greater accountability for the implementation of women, peace and security, and for indeed for gender equality, if you could be as brief as possible. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. I'll, I'll try. So one of the key takeaways from our work with, with parliaments uh, in this area is that while each oversight actor, uh, parliament, civil society, organizations, uh, ombuds institutions, audits uh, institutions, uh, all of them have their own means of, at, at their disposal to provide accountability. But sustainable change happens when they work in partnerships with one another. And I think like uh, other initiatives and, and studies in this area, we have found that institution-led uh, efforts, especially those led by parliamentary women caucuses that take place over time can be particularly impactful as opposed to one-off interactions or personal vanity projects. Uh, one recent example of this is, uh, for instance, the, the work of the Parliamentary Women's Caucus in Sierra Leone that's convened key actors to consider the implications of having a militarized pandemic response. By way of background, uh, the Parliament of Sierra Leone has adopted quite a strong peace building identity since the Civil War and has been engaging quite systematically with actors across the board on the gendered um, dimensions of uh, peace and security in general. Like other countries in the region, uh, Sierra Leone learned hard lessons from the Ebola epidemic. And so even before the first case of COVID was detected, the caucus traveled to the constituencies and convened actors involved in crisis response. Um, that's emergency operation centers, uh, border authorities, um, security sector actors, community leaders, women's organizations, uh, they convened them to, to address and to elevate the discussion on having the military and law enforcement personnel deployed to manage, for example, movement restrictions and what that meant for women. And despite that, that earlier Ebola experience, it was found that uh, the limited participation of women in the security sector and in its oversight and also the insufficient training of uh, the military and uh, the police um, still resulted in systematic abuses, especially uh, of women petty tra traders and um, cross-border traders, uh, which the caucus then uh, publicly identified as a priority for, for reform. Another example I wanted to highlight is that of Kyrgyzstan. As I, I think it, it further highlights uh, the impact of, for example, Jamilia's work with, with institutions. Uh, so there, a group of women parliamentarians from across the political spectrum, the so-called Forum of Women Parliamentarians, has also been particularly effective in partnering with civil society, like Jamilia's organization, to institutionalize uh, women, peace and security commitments beyond the national action plan. Um, for example, through a parliamentary gender sensitivity and women, peace and security roadmap that made it an institution uh, like uh, or speakers before me said, made by men and for men, made it an institution that's more accountable to women and committed to, to gender equality through its ways of working. Now the MPs have uh, been also actively involved in, for example, the, the UNITE campaign against uh, gender-based violence. And um, together with women leaders in civil society, they developed a formal structure within the parliament for more routine and systematic collaboration, uh, a council for gender equality and gender-based violence. Uh, during COVID, that, that council has successfully pushed uh, 
for key law reform uh, amendments. Uh, for example, uh, calling for better um, and immediate protection of survivors of, of uh, gender-based violence. And, and they have also been very effective in mobilizing support from, from male allies. For example, on the adoption of a 30% quota for women's participation in the local government. But a final point I wanted to make, and I, I hope that it will at least partly address one of the questions uh, I saw in, in the chat that Mirko posted uh, regarding a backlash against gender equality in, in public institutions. Um, so the use of the examples um, that I just mentioned it might be limited because no two contexts are the same, no two parliaments and are the same, and what worked in, in country A will not necessarily work in country B. Uh, but what we see more and more of are challenges faced by gender equality advocates, women, peace and security advocates that are shared across national borders. Uh, and, and those are, for instance, the, the rise of religious influences in, in politics that seek to redefine or, or reduce women's rights as, mother, as merely mother's rights. Uh, we see far right ideologies that divide people based on core identities, including gender identities. We see attacks on women's reproductive rights and protests against those that are brutally pacified by, by the police. And finally, we are also witnessing this deluge of gender hate speech, sometimes at the hands of state actors that knows no geographic boundaries, especially as it's, as it's moving online. And so given these trends and challenges, many national platforms are becoming increasingly less safe and more sensitive for dialogue. So I think the examples that we need more of are those of cross-border safe spaces and knowledge exchanges with participation of women parliamentarians and, and their male allies to reimagine existing regional mechanisms and to, to invent new ones. And this is what, what UNDP, for example, is looking to, uh, to provide uh, going forward in, in our work with parliamentarians. Thank you. Agata, thank you uh, very much for, for your response. I'm gonna go straight now to, to Susan and to ask you what oversight bodies can do to overcome challenges and be more effective in holding the SSIs to account for implementing the Women, Peace and Security agenda, including gender equality. Susan, I don't know if you're there. I can't Sorry. hear. Yeah, oh. I'll be brief. Be independent. Do the right thing. Push boundaries. Obviously, you've got to keep within the law and you keep within your remit, but explore what you can do, not focus on what you can't do. Work with others. Parliament, both parliamentarians individually, and parliamentary bodies, committees, civil society organisations, other ombudsman's institutions, the national human rights institutions, nationally and internationally with ombudsman's associations. Be accountable, be transparent, be brave, role model all those things. Be open on diversity, publish disaggr gender disaggregated statistics, recognize progress, but be critical where there's a failure to make progress. Fill gaps. If you can't take anonymous complaints, find out who can. Share experiences, learn from each other, and above all, keep messaging. Keep on saying the same things over and over and over again. And if I can give just one example from the UK that pulls all this together and builds on what all my colleagues have said, because there's some really good examples here and we're sharing a lot of key themes. When I was first appointed the Service Complaints Commissioner in 2007, the Ministry of Defence wanted me to stay in my office and just oversee complaints. And I said, I wasn't going to do that. 
I was going to go out and about like de Miller throughout the country. I talked to Parliament. I volunteered to apply to appear before our defence committee. I worked with senior military. I worked with MPs. I worked with voluntary organisations. I worked with representative bodies. In my annual reports, I showed diversity statistics. I showed that the majority of complaints came disproportionately from women and people from the black and Asian minority ethnic communities. I kept saying the system was failing. I pushed for new powers. I worked with one woman parliamentarian who later became our most senior Minister of Defence. She was only Minister of Defence, Secretary of State for Defence for three months, but in that time, building on her experience of my work and my office and her own experience as a Naval Reservist officer, she commissioned the, head of the then head of the Air Force to undertake a review of inappropriate behaviour. He came out with very, very strong recommendations, most, but not all of which have been implemented. So the Defence Committee in Parliament instituted its own investigation and asked for, for evidence from serving personnel. And the current Senior Minister of Defence allowed women in the armed forces who are currently serving to give evidence. This, is, this was a real departure, this had not been done before. And over 9% of women in the armed forces gave evidence, as well as civil society organisations. And other men have really taken up the challenge. Both the current and the previous Vice Chief of the Defence Staff have really led on the Women, Peace and Security agenda. And now the current Vice Chief is embedding Women, Peace and Security as part of human security. So, I'm, so as Andre Mundell said, men can make a difference, women can make a difference, ombuds institutions can make a difference. But the key, as Agatha said, is to work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan, for those insightful words. Um, I'd like to conclude the round of questioning very briefly by going to Jamelia. Uh, we, we're very, very short of time. We've still got questions from participants um, to go through. So thank you all for your um, spending a little bit of extra time with us today. Uh, but I wonder, Jamelia, uh, could you tell us, based on your organization, uh, with the support of the OSC in Kyrgyzstan, uh, you've created a network of women leaders working at the community level to prevent conflict and combat gender-based violence. I wonder if you could give us one very brief example of the collaboration between this network and the security sector. Спасибо большое. Я буду кратко, как вы сказали. После того конфликта 10 -го года, используя основной принцип резолюции 1325 как участие женщин, мы мобилизировали местных лидеров, которые занимались предотвращением конфликта и постконфликтового восстановления. И эти женщины были объединены в сеть. Сеть сейчас называется инициативной группы женщин. Сеть поддерживает уже 8 лет центр УБСЕ в городе Бишкек. В прошлом году эта сеть распространилась и на, на всю страну. То есть в каждой области есть сеть инициативных групп женщин. И так как основными направлениями, основными вопросами, которые решают члены сети, являются гендерное насилие, вопросы ранних браков, кражи невест, домашнего насилия, вопросы миростроительства, приграничные конфликты, то они, во-первых, должны и участвовать в партнерстве с государственными органами, особенно с правоохранительными органами. И я не буду сейчас много говорить, а приведу просто один пример, что почти каждый год Члены сети 
в наших местных сообществах поддерж... подписывают меморандум э, с местным э, отделением милиции о взаимодействии. То есть, например, буквально вот яркий пример расскажу. Вчера одна женщина не смогла обратиться, пришла она по поводу домашнего насилия в милицию. Ее не приняли заявление, а постовой ее отправил к участковому, а участковый находится в 40 километрах от, где живет пострадавшая, с четырьмя детьми, избитая, очень в тяжелом состоянии, туда ехать она не могла. И наши женщины помогли тем, что у нашей местной лидера ИГЖ был подписан меморандум, были личные встречи, были номера телефонов записаны. То есть через вот такой механизм партнерства заявление от этой женщины было принято. Это буквально вчера вечером случилось. Было принято, и женщине стали помогать. В этом году мы планируем очень тоже интересное будет партнерство. Центр ОБСЕ в Бишкеке поддержал Министерство внутренних дел в организации передвижной патрульной милиции. То есть милиция будет теперь ездить по графику. И сеть инициативных групп женщин буквально послезавтра мы делаем большую встречу в сети с представителями этой патрульной передвижной милиции. Я думаю, что это будет еще один из эффективных механизмов для того, чтобы помогать нашим нуждающимся женщинам снижать уровень гендерного насилия. Спасибо большое. Я могу еще много говорить, Андрей, много примеров конкретных, на местах, живых, но, как вы говорите, у нас чуть-чуть со временем. Спасибо за внимание. Now I'm going to ask all the, the panelists to deliver any concluding re remarks you want to make. Um, I'm going to direct you also to the questions in the, the Q&A section and for you to, um, as best you can, to, to try and cover these uh, questions very, very briefly um, in your concluding remarks. Um, And first, I'd like to go to, to Carmen, if it's possible for you to take the floor now. If you could restrict your remarks to, 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 to one minute each, that would be, that would be much appreciated. Thank you very much. Okay, eh, gracias. Ahora sí, ahí tra se escucha la traducción. Eh, bueno, más bien voy a decir lo que tenía que, lo que quería decir antes es eh, hablar sobre el tema de la, de la supervisión de seguridad privada, que me parece muy importante, nos parece muy importante sobre todo porque es un sector manejado por ex militares y donde se reproducen los roles de género eh, que están en la sociedad, solo con, eh, que incluso más, intens, más intensos en ese sentido. Eh, hemos visto una oportunidad en trabajar con hacer conciencia a los usuarios de las empresas de seguridad privada para que puedan contratar y para que exijan la contratación de mujeres. Aquí, como en otros servicios, eh, la visibilidad de las mujeres es casi nula y entonces no hay ni oferta de servicios de las mujeres ni tampoco hay una demanda de servicios de mujeres porque no existe en el imaginario la participación de las mujeres asociada al uso de la, de la fuerza o al uso de armas. En ese sentido también y contestando algunas de las preguntas eh, que habían en el, en, 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 en el panel, eh, eh, la, el tema de la maternidad es muy importante para este tipo de empresas porque precisamente a las mujeres no se les quiere contratar por los, eh, por, porque tienen que dar eh, los, eh, las, eh, los tiempos para la maternidad y consideran que eso es una pérdida para la empresa, eh, sobre todo en el ámbito de la seguridad privada. 
Eh, sin embargo, eh, hemos, con ayuda de DICAF, hemos desarrollado una agenda, para, una, una guía para eh, poder enseñar, para poder mostrar a los usuarios las ventajas de contratar seguridad privada, por un lado, para pedir mujeres la, la capacidad que tienen las mujeres para determinadas tareas en seguridad privada, pero por otra también, eh, entender que si el usuario no pide la presencia de mujeres, las empresas no lo están ofertando. Entonces, en ese sentido, también consideramos que el poder preguntar cuál es la lógica o cuál es, cuáles son los servicios de género o el enfoque de género eh, que deben tener los servicios de seguridad privada por parte de los usuarios también hace modificar y transformar la posibilidad en que estos servicios también cumplan con esas, eh, con esas normas en materia de género. Eh, ahí lo dejo. Eh, muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Carmen. If I could go straight to Catherine now for your very brief concluding remarks. I don't think we can hear Katerina, or at least I can't. In that case, I'm going to ask Susan if, if you would like to take the floor. Um, first of all, can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Yes, we can hear you now. No. Uh, for, like three main uh, points <clears throat> at the end. Th first of all, thank you very much for this very interesting discussion, which connected different countries and even continents. Second, uh, this discussion shows that we have absolutely similar problems in different countries. And it means that uh, international standards and international approaches are very important for implementing a national agenda. And uh, that is why localization of such instruments as uh, so, uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 and its six uh, sisters resolutions are very important, is very important as well. And third and last, in Ukraine, we look at women, peace and security agenda as key for ensuring and implementing gender equality policy. And we look at uh, all um, UN Security Council um, uh, documents like 1325 and Sisters Resolutions as important part of, of international standards on gender equality, which help us to promote and develop gender equality policy at national and local level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Susan, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew. Looking at the questions, there are a huge range of issues being raised. And I would say individually, we can't tackle all of them. Collectively, though, we can make a start. I've been a gender equality expert now for over 40 years, including leading our then Equality Opportunity, Gender Equality Opportunity Commission. Um, and you have to take a long view. Uh, I've seen huge progress in the military context, even in the last few years. Uh, so, you know, don't give up hope. If you want to start, get the DCAF Gender Equality Toolkit. It's a really good start. But above all, work together. Thank you very much, Susan, for that very uh, succinct and uh, inspiring advice for all of us. Uh, I want to go now to Jamelia for your very uh, brief concluding remarks. The floor is yours, Jamelia. Mm -hmm. Спасибо большое. Uh, Во-первых, uh, я хочу сказать, что несмотря на 20-летие резолюции uh, 1325, несмотря на существование четырех uh, планов uh, этой резолюции в Кыргызстане, Последний приграничный конфликт в мае месяце на юге Кыргызстана показал, что э, учреждения безопасности, органы безопасности не могут защитить женщин, детей, их потребности и их жизни. Второй момент, то что э, нет государственного финансирования наших планов. Планы по резолюции, имплементации резолюции 1325 – 
выполняются неправительственными организациями при помощи международных э, организаций, таких как ОБСЕ, ООН «Женщины». И в-третьих, э, я хочу сказать, что э, сложно работать в условиях э, поднимания головы традиционализма и э, религиозного фундаментализма. Спасибо большое. Thank you very, very much, Amelia. And, and with those words, I think uh, we can um, conclude um, the, the session of questions and answers with our speakers. Um, I would just like to, to say a few brief, brief words and, and remind everyone that we've heard very important inputs in advance, to advance the women, peace and security agenda through the personal experiences of our distinguished speaker uh, list and through the participation um, of all of you here today through your questions uh, that you posed at the channel. The outcomes of today's discussion will inform the way forward as we engage to promote good governance within the security sector to advance the goals of the agenda. For those of you interested in the topic, I invite you to read the policy brief a security sector governance approach to the women, peace and security agenda, which is part of the gender and security team toolkit. And with that, I would like to say a big, big thank you to all of you who've participated today, to our speakers, um, to all of you who, who've listened in, uh, to have answered, uh, asked questions. Um, I hope we were able to get to all of your questions. Um, and to, 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 to thank each and all of you individually for your excellent participation today. Um, I would also like to thank the interpreters who did a, a wonderful job. It's not the, the easiest thing to do, uh, certainly to, to interpret an online meeting. Um, and also to thank the organizations who were involved today to, to DCAF, to UN Women, and also to my own organization, the OSC ODEA. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Natasha has shared a short survey uh, for you to evaluate the webinar. Please um, complete the survey. Uh, we want to hear from you um, in terms of what you think and what you're interested to, to hear in the future. So your answers will, will guide uh, what we do next and, and the, the, the issues and the questions uh, we put in the, in the webinar in the future. Thank you very much to everyone. До свидания.